So today I'm going to talk about different tests that happens in the clinical diagnostic lab during the workup of cancer. And um, I have nothing to disclose. And these are the objectives, uh, CME objectives for today. So first, I would like to introduce you to these four patients. They represent different aspects of a genetics workup for cancer patients. Patient E is a BALL patient. We received a pretty straightforward diagnostic peripheral blood sample. The sample has 77% uh, abnormal immature B lymphocyte, lymphoblasts. Patient M is also a BAL diagnostic uh, patient, but it's challenging because the sample we received only has 0.69% of abnormal blast, and the patient had a bone marrow done at a different lab, uh, but it failed karyotype. So this obviously is gonna be some challenge to work up. Patient C is an MDS patient known to have MDS for a while, but the disease is persisting and the patient always had normal karyotype. Molecular studies showed ASXL1, E2, AF2, uh, AF1 mutation, and now it's persisting. So the patient comes to us for further risk assessment. The last patient is actually a, retros a retrospective research study. It's an AML diagnostic bone marrow specimen. Uh, we know it's from a 26-year-old male, and it has 58% abnormal myeloid blast. So it should be straightforward. So I'm going to take you through the diagnostic journey of these four patients while I uh, sort of fold in different kind of tech clinical tests that were used. So, no matter what kind of test we run in the lab, uh, we have to identify abnormality. So we can think about it in this way, is that the first stage, there must be something that we do to reveal the abnormality. So it can be a biological process or biochemical process to somehow make the abnormality show itself in a way that it can be visible either to human eyes or through the assistance of microscopy or through some kind of instrument, such as an imager, a machine, a, a sequencer. That's the second step of the detect, uh, detection is detect or image. Then we go to the first stage of interpretation, is that based on what we read or what we see, we must be able to truthfully read out a result. Then we re go to our second stage of interpretation. Then we take this result and compare to what we know as normal. Those who work in labs know normal does not mean identical. Everyone is different. So when you have a clinical assay, it's very important that you establish the range of normal. So you can have a, have a uh, then you can compare your results to that. So once you compare that with the normal range, you come up with a call for that specific data point. Is it normal or is it abnormal? Then you go to your final stage of interpretation just to see, is this variance even clinically significant? So this applies to all assays. And let's keep in mind as we walk through our different tests. Structural rearrangements is the focus of our talk today. These encompasses losses, gains, or rearrangements of DNA fragments that can be either balanced, such as translocations, inversions, or insertions, or it can be unba unbalanced, that um, entails copy number variances, such as deletion, duplication, or supernumerary um, marker chromosomes. And I grouped these clinical tests into uh, three major types that we use currently. These are the single target assays. They usually are the tests that we run when we know what we're looking for. They're usually very specific and we can turn around very quickly. And there are some whole genome assays uh, that look at many things at the same time. And then there are something that's called multi-target, so it's somewhere in between. You know somehow where you're, what you're looking for, but not exactly, so you run some kind of panel. And last, I'll touch base about uh, a new assay on the horizon, which is optic genome mapping. So the single target assay, these are the two that I would like to uh, kind of kind of compare and contrast. Uh, these are uh, fish, uh, fish fluorescent in situ hybridization versus PCR. So in fish assay, we reveal the abnormality uh, via hybridization. And we use probes that are in the size of hundreds of KBs to a megabase pair ranges. And in contrast to that, PCR uses amplification. And what we see is it's amplicon. 
right? And the amplicon sizes are in the range of 100 base pairs. So let's keep in mind of this very big difference in the size between a probe versus a PCR amplicon. So if we go to um, what we detect, in fish, we all use microscopy. It's still largely human eyes. Just look at each indiv individual cell. These are the three major types of fish probes that we use. So copy number is straightforward by counting on different uh, signals. It's either deletion, gain, or amplification. Dual fusion and the break part is a little bit complicated. Dual fusion is when we know what are the two fusion partners. Uh, we run the fish probe, and when we see fusion signals of the fish probe, that signifies abnormality. Break apart fish is the kind of assay that we run when we target a genomic locus that's known to rearrange, but with many partners, such as MIC or RUNX1, KMT2A. Uh, you cannot uh, design that many dual fusion fish, so we just use a set of probe that targets that locus. And in these situations, it's when the probes separate uh, that we call an re a rearrangement abnormality. With PCR, we look at the amplicons uh, either size or the presence of absence of them. From there, we can conclude if it's normal or abnormal, or we can also do it through a quantitative real-time PCR where the quantity of the amplicon, uh, such as PCR able uh, transcript, is what we use to call the abnormality. So I just want to use uh, this particular BCR able workup to compare and contrast between the two assays. As we know, for example, in the uh, ALL workup, BCR able is always done as a stat. We need to turn around within a result, or within a day, no more than two days. And if we run fish, we're hybridizing these fish probes in the hundreds of KB ranges to our target. So it really doesn't matter where the breakpoint occurs. We can almost always pick up the fusion. Uh, in contrast to that, PCR, because it's very precise in its target, uh, so for depending on what, what fusion isoform we're targeting, we need to have different assays. Um, so that's why it's important when we start a sample when we don't know at all if there's BCR able rearrangement. It's important to run both FISH and PCR. So here is the comparison between the two assays. Fish can target all the way to uh, hundreds of KB ranges, and PCR can go all the way to the exon or intron range. And uh, fish cannot, usually cannot distinguish fusion isoforms. PCR can, uh, but that's also the flip side here is that fish is much less uh, susceptible to false negative result due to breakpoint variation, but PCR is. So we run these assays from, for these two BLL patients. Patient E, despite 77% of immature B blast, we found 20, uh, 22Q gain in just 34.4% of the cells, and there's no BCR able array arrangement. So why, what, what does this result mean? Right? Obviously, this is not complete. And patient M, uh, had no fusion of BCR able, but again, it showed two uh, sh showed gain of 9Q and plus 22Q. So what does this mean? Is this hyperdeployed? Um, so we need to run more study. So that's when we run to our uh, then go to our whole genome assay. Uh, the first assay is obviously karyotype. So karyotype is an assay that reveal the abnormality through culture and harvest where the, app, the chromosomes are bended and then prepared onto slides, right? They can be then detected through microscopy, either during a, a, using a scanner that scans the whole slide, or the uh, technologists can look at the spread under the microscope. Then these chromosomes are nicely aligned into a karyogram. Then we do band by band comparison to call out the abnormality. So here are just some examples. Some of them are very obvious, such as deletion 5Q. Others are rather subtle, such as inversion 16. And here is just what 922 looks like. So we found out these variations. Then we go to the final stage to say, is this variation benign? Uh, or is it clonal? All of these are important to figure out before we can make a clinical interpretation. Here I'm just showing an example of inversion 9. This is a pericentric inversion that happens in about 1% of the population. It looks different, but it's actually benign. 
So karyotype, because of the need to reveal the abnormalities of your culture, it requires fresh, viable specimen. And the pro of that, it is actually a whole genome assay. It looks at single cells, so it can demonstrate clonal evolution unambiguously. Uh, the drawback is that this assay is very manual, is labor intensive. So usually we can just report out 20 cells. And the purple part, what I put is really, I think it's a feature. It's not, not a pro nor a con of the assay, is that this assay reveals abnormalities from metaphase cells only. So in a way, cancer cells love to grow. If you give them the right environment, you can actually reveal them, reveal them quite readily. So karyotype is a standard workup that's done all over the nation in all the cytogenetic labs. Uh, so in our patient, patient E now got an abnormal karyotype of two out of 21, that has plus 21 and plus 22. If we only look at this karyotype, this is actually a good, uh, a good prognosis, but we wonder two cells out of 21, is that really the main clone? Patient M, surprisingly, despite the less than 1% of blast, it was, the sample was very happy in the culture for BLL, that's really impressive. Uh, it grew, it gave us a metaphase with lots and lots of trisomies. So is this hyperdeployed? Is this good prognosis? Patient C, again, just like all the other labs before us, we got normal karyotype, so that didn't help. And patient N is interesting. It has multiple trisomies in an AML diagnostic sample. So if we go with the European leukemia net uh, risk classification, if we go with the 2017 guideline, this is complex karyotype because it has more than three pluses. However, if we go with the 2022 guideline, multiple trisomies is no longer considered as complex. So this is not high risk. So is it high risk or is it not? All right, so obviously we're not done. We need to do more work. So let's move on. Now we go to the next level of whole genome assay. This is chromosome genomic array testing, or called, or we call it CGAT. CGAT is an assay where we take high molecular weight genomic DNA uh, through fragmentation, amplification, and labeling. Uh, these labeled DNA fragments are bind, uh, bound onto a wafer where we can read out signal to determine the copy number probe or uh, allelic status of the specimen. So this assay can run on fresh, frozen, or archived specimen. It doesn't need tissue culture, so that's very versatile. It can be whole genome or targeted, depending on how the assay was designed. It can detect submicroscopic genomic lesions. It can also detect loss of heterozygosity. Uh, when there are different abnormality levels, we can infer clonal evolution, although we cannot be definitive. This assay cannot detect low-level aberrations, uh, so it's not an assay for minimal residual disease detection. Uh, it cannot detect balanced rearrangement. It does not distinguish between cells. So with that in mind, we look at the result output. So this is what we call a whole genome output, where all the chromosomes are lying down here, 1 through 22, X and Y. On top is the copy number track, where the blue dots and the yellow line tracks the copy number. And if it's around 0, it means it's normal. Bottom here is what we call the allelic track. Specifically, this is B allele frequency. Uh, in a normal setting, we should see three clear tracks, top, middle, and bottom. And if we look at these here, these are the examples of a deletion, uh, a deletion in 3P, a gain in chromosome 7, and a copy neutral loss of heterozygosity of the short arm of chromosome 9. So what that means is that the copy number is not deleted, but the track of allelic track is different. So this is copy neutral loss of heterozygosity. So with that in mind, let's see what we show in our patient. So for patient E, this BLL patient, we ran CGAT, and it showed numerous small genomic lesions in the range of 30 to 80 percent of cells, including the ICROS-1 deletion, a very focal deletion that's around 60 kb long. So the ICROS-1 gene encodes the protein ICROS. It's a very important transcription regulator for lymphopoiesis. And this gene came to attention in around 2008 when Mulligan's group detected 
the focal deletion of these genes in about 15% of pediatric ALL and over 40% of uh, adult ALL. So the deletion can either take out the whole gene like this, or it can take out the early, uh, the first few axons or all the way, uh, or, or the last few axons. In those cases, the deletion would just abolish the transcription. So that's a haploinsufficiency. Uh, the consequence is haploinsufficiency. But sometimes we have the deletion of just a few axons in the middle, like in this case, very frequently is a four to seven deletion. This does not abolish the transcription, it gives a oncogenic isoform that can be then translated into an abnormal protein that cannot bind with DNA, but it can bind with the normal ECROS from the other normal allele. So in a way, it's a dominant negative factor that would inhibit the function of ECROS altogether. So here, just an example from array, uh, we can somehow infer what it might be. Like the top patient is most likely just deletion that takes out the middle few exons, while uh, the bottom one takes out more exons. So the bottom one is more likely to be uh, uh, haploinsufficiency as the consequence. So that's the first patient. The second patient of BLL, as I mentioned, uh, it has lots of trisomies. And we were wondering, is this hyperdeployed? Is this a good prognosis? So before we go in there, uh, let, I think I would like to show you this heat map. Uh, so this is a heat map of many ALL patients. And each column represents a patient. And their chromosome arranged from one all the way to the sex chromosome at the bottom. Blue represents gain, and uh, sorry, blue represents deletion, and red pre represents gain. So if we focus on this first block and the third block, these are the karyotypes or the genomes that has lots of monosomies. So either near haploid, where they're like less than 30 micro, uh, chromosomes, or uh, low hyperdiploid, lots of losses. These are known to be high risk. We also know that if the ALO genome simply gained a few chromosomes, like trisomy, those are good risk, okay? So gain is good, loss is not good. The problem is in ALL, sometimes the abnormal cancer genome can duplicate itself. So in this case, near haploid can duplicate itself and it would look normal even with, uh, it would look abnormal, but just with gains. Same thing with low hyperdiploid, it can also duplicate itself, and it looks like there are just lots of trisomies. So when we had this karyotype, it's highly suspicious that this is actually a masked low, hyper, uh, low hyperdiploid sample. To really uh, clarify that, we ran CGAT. And this, uh, well, to run CGAT on this sample, we have to do flow sorting first to, to enrich the immature uh, B cells. Uh, so here's the enriched sample. And if we look at these copy number tracks closely, I'm going to enlarge some. So this is chromosome three and chromosome seven. You can see that these two by SIGA, they're actually deleted. And not only them, chromosome 13, 15, 16, 17, and 20 are all actually deleted. And if you compare those with the karyotype on top, you'll see that those are not there because in the cells, it looks like there are two copies. Well, in fact, there were actually monosomies that were deleted. So the karyotype, it was then finally reported as a monosomy, multiple monosomies that duplicate itself. This is, this is a very classic example of masked hyperdiploid ALL, which is high risk. Now, MDS patient, our third patient, normal karyotype, uh, per our diagnostic algorithm, we would need to do CGAT, and we did. And if we look really closely on chromosome 7, there is a tiny deletion that takes out the gene COX-1. So COX-1 is a known, uh, is a known uh, is, COX-1 deletion is a known recurrent abnormality for myeloid neoplasm, and it's proposed to associate with adverse clinical outcome. All right, so those are some examples of how, how CGAT can help us in the diagnostic journey of cancer patients. Next, we go to multi-target uh, assays. Specifically, I'll go over targeted RNA sequencing. 
So targeted RNA sequencing, it's a panel, and it's an RNA-based next-generation sequencing panel. So I think we can come back to this again, where uh, we break down each assay into different blocks and what, and what they do. Um, maybe you don't need to look at all the details of the steps, but perhaps we can just focus on the human versus computer. Um, what I want to ho hope you can appreciate is that for these earlier assays, so the assays may be developed years ago or recent years, at every step, even, when, even if we use computer, uh, it's largely the decision is made by human. For example, for CGAT, when we plot those dots onto whole genome plot or onto different kind of analysis suite, the computer does not make a decision to which probe to plot, which probe not to plot. It's going to plot everything. Human goes in and use our eyes to visualize them and make a decision, just like what we did right now. However, when it comes to next generation sequencing, no matter what kind next generation sequencing you're doing, uh, the sequencer would pump out millions of reads and there's no way a human can visualize them and then make, make a decision. So there are many key steps of this assay that's done by computer only and using something we call algorithm. Um, so th this makes it very challenging and um, just to keep that in mind. So when we when our lab decided we're going to do target RNA sequencing and we understand that all these algorithms are there, so what is the path that we took? So what we thought is if we have a, non, a, a good cohort of samples and we just try to test out all the popular assays that's out there on the market and to see how they perform compared to each other, then we can learn. And that's what we did. So we collaborated with the prostate cancer spore uh, uh, group at Fra Hutchinson San Cancer Center. We're able to obtain a group of uh, samples that are well curated. We know what kind of fusion it has there. So we decided to test four different panels. Uh, some of these are really popular. They're still out there. Um, what we concluded is that when the, when the fusion is known and when the fusion breakpoint is also known, meaning that which exon it hits, uh, all four panels function really well and it detected all of them. Then we have fusions such as Timpress 2 ETV4. This is a fusion where these two genes are known to fuse. But the particular fusion the sample had, the breakpoint location was novel. Um, and we discovered that the assays start to perform differently. Some of them are expected to not detect it because it's not on their menu. Uh, others, although they have it on their menu, it's still not detected. So for this particular panel A, we worked with the company and we troubleshooted and we round out, found out that the fusion is actually present in the sequencing file, but it's the analysis process that could not recognize that is a fusion. So that's the second scenario. The third scenario is what if it's just a novel fusion altogether? These two genes, may not, we may not know that they would fuse. So we're using this ET, the sample with ETV1 fusion. So this is, we ran fish and it's a break apart fish. So clearly this gene is rearranged. And there are three different partners. Some of them are novel completely, others are just rare. And you can see that out of the four panels, uh, regardless of what they say their assay targets, uh, it, the performance is just not the same. So from that point on, we decided to go with our current assay. And the reason that this assay has a relatively high detection rate is because it used anchored multiplex PCR, where the library prep entails the PCR process of primer one primer that targets the driver gene, the gene-specific primer, or the other primer is just a random primer. So it can tell us the fusion not only between known, gene, known partners as well as unknown partners. And we validate it and we used it clinically. And that's about when this patient came back. So as I said, we worked up this patient, the patient then went on to treatment and showed refractory disease. So at that point, uh, I talked to the physician and say, hey, maybe there's something more in this patient that we should find out. So we decided to pull the old sample uh, from this, uh, pr the diagnostic workup and we ran targeted RNA sequencing on them. And we found that this patient indeed has a ICROS-1 oncogenic isoform. That's not surprising given the deletion. And the patient also has an IPOR-IGH fusion transcript. So I'll go over both of them. 
So again, just as a refresher, E equals one deletion can just be uh, taking care, taking out a few exons. And this patient, this is exactly what uh, what we see on target RNA sequencing. If you, it, it deleted the exons four through seven was deleted, leading to the fusion between exon three and eight. So about EPOR, about EPOR IGH rearrangement. So EPOR encodes the urethropoietin receptor gene. In wild type, when it's wild type, this protein is expressed at a relatively low level. And when it's working, it's on the cell membrane. It has an extracellular domain where it receives signals and activate the protein. And it has intracellular domain that's important for stimulation of JAK-STAT pathway. And it's also important for the down regulation and degradation of this protein. So there is a nice mechanism to keep it in check. During fusion, however, this gene now is put right next to IGH uh, enhancer. So this gene is expressed the transcripts and protein are at a much higher level than in wild type cells. At the same time, the protein is not normal because the intracellular domain is no longer there due to the deletion as a consequence of the fusion. Uh, so there is no residues remaining that can regulate the degradation of the protein. So this protein is now in super action. It leads to super activation of JAXTA pathway. So just to show you the result, what we saw is the fusion at exon 8 of EPOR, which is a pretty frequent place for fusion to happen, uh, that fused with IGH. And we were able to follow up with uh, uh, RT-PCR and Sanger sequencing to verify uh, the presence of the fusion using a different, with a different technology. So this now classifies the patient as a pH-like ALL. This is known to be a high-risk group of ALL patient. It is more prevalent in older patients. This patient is 50 years old. And in older patients, it also has an even poorer prognosis than in younger patients. Okay, so that's target RNA sequencing. If we look at it in the context of these other assays that can look at fusion, it can detect fusion all the way down to the level of X distinguished axons, but keep in mind, it only works if the fusion actually generates a transcript. All right, so that's multi, uh, that's multi target assay using TRS as, as an example. And next, we'll look at what's on the horizon, which is optic genome mapping. So optic is something means that it images the genome and it maps. So it takes a picture of the genome and use the picture to try to map it to see if everything is falling into the right place. So that's this assay in a nutshell. So we start with ultra high molecular weight DNA. The DNA is then treated with the enzyme that target a special six base pair location. Wherever this sequence is, the enzyme can go in and label it with a green uh, fluorescent dye. Then the backbone of the DNA is labeled blue. The DNA is then untangled and stretched into a thin thread and flow through these channels. If I can turn it on, I cannot, really. For some reason, I cannot. That's unfortunate. So what it's going to show you is that all of these are the DNA, and there are different uh, thickness or uh, different thickness of combs that the DNAs are going to flow through. Eventually, they become a thin strand and they flow through. They flow under a high resolution camera where pictures are taken uh, and just like this. And these are used to analyze the sample. So this assay, it's very important for it to process ultra high molecular weight DNA. And that has such a strong implication for this assay that how DNA and samples should be handled is very different from what we learn, what we know in, in all other genetic field. And just to put it in comparison with uh, short resequencing, if we put, put a sample on the sequencer, no matter it's iron torrent or MySeq, uh, the DNA fragment size is in, in the range of hundreds of base pair. But for it to be able to work on OGM's instrument, it has to be at least 150 kilobase pair. And all the way, it can be megabase. Uh, size is long. And it's just like, you know, almost like comparing the size of a sandwich with uh, several space needles stacked on top of each other. So one thing I want to emphasize is that OGM 
This is um, an assay that aligns the sequences and aligns them. It does not use the DNA sequence to align them. Rather, it uses the count and spacing of these labels to do its alignment. So depending on which analysis pipeline you choose, uh, we can have rare variant analysis, which is most appropriate for somatic variant detection, or de novo analysis, which is most appropriate for constitutional variant detection. And depending on the different analysis pipeline, your data size is different and the resolution, uh, you know, the functionality of what you will get is different. But one thing good about it is that you can do the wet work and get your data. You can run one analysis and if you decide that you need more information, you can just rerun the analysis using a different pipeline. So after the analysis, we'll get various plots. Um, this is a circles plot where all the chromosomes are aligned in a circle. From there, you can get copy number changes as well as rearrangements. You can also get a whole genome plot. This is very similar to SIGA where the chromosomes are aligned in a flat, flat line uh, where you get the increase or decrease of certain regions. And depending on the pipeline, you may even be able to look at allelic changes. And if you would like to zoom in and look at detailed view, uh, you can have the sequence aligned to reference genomes. So the blue segment in the middle is our sample, is what we get from a sample. We call it a sampled genome. And then the top and bottom green track is the reference genome. So this is a, DNA, a long DNA fragment. Part of it nicely aligned with the short arm of chromosome 16 and partly aligned nicely with the long arm of chromosome 16. So this is actually a readout of inversion 16, which is a frequent um, abnormality in AML. So what about this sample? This sample that has multiple trisomies, and we were wondering what the risk is. So we run, uh, ran OGM. This is the whole genome plot. And from here, from these thick blue lines, we can conclude that indeed this sample has all these trisomies. And if we look at these rearrangement results and we look at around chromosome 11 and 12, we can see there appears to be a cryptic rearrangement between 11p and 12p. And if we look at the detail view, this is the DNA fragment that gave us the signal. Part of it aligned with 11P15, where NUP98 is, and the other half of it aligned with 12P13, where KDM5A is. So clearly, this patient, other than all those trisomies, it has a NUP98 fusion, which is associated with unfavorable clinical outcome. So that's just one of the patients we tested using OGM. Uh, we were able to obtain a cohort of AML diagnostic samples from the Frahatch repository. We tested 27 of them. So before OGM, this is the risk breakdown of this cohort, where green is favorable risk, favorable karyotype, gray is intermediate, meaning it's normal, or there are some abnormalities, but they're not considered high risk and the dark red are the ones that would be considered as high risk. So after we ran OGM, we were able to identify unfavorable markers in six patients. These include uh, MLL par partial tandem duplication in two patients, and complex karyotype that was clarified that include deletion 5Q and NOP98 fusion, that's the patient we just looked at, as well as TAT2 deletion and NF1 deletion. It also clarified the abnormalities of two other patients. So where does OGM fit within the whole genome assays in the clinical lab? If we say karyotype can look at both balanced and unbalanced reg uh, abnormality, but with a limited resolution to just about a few megabase pairs. CGAT can look at unbalanced abnormalities down to tens of kilobase pairs. OGM can actually look at both, and it can go down to hundreds of base pairs in your range. But do keep in mind that this requires ultra-high molecular weight DNA, so it can only uh, take fresh and frozen sample. 
CGAT is the most versatile in terms of sample type, and the karyotype is the only one that can look at single cells. So each of them has their own unique strength. So karyotype, now we know that it's the only whole genome single cell assay, but it's so labor intensive. What's on the horizon? Well, this is really, really early. Uh, what's on the horizon is actually that there are now um, artificial intelligence tools that some of them are clinically, uh, some of them are commercially available, and our lab is also involved in the development of our own tool. These are the tools that, at current stage, they can take chromosome and they can recognize what they are, and even some. Uh, pretty obvious abnormalities that the, uh, they can call. So st still, this is very early, and the only thing that we can confirm that it can do is when the metaphase is nice looking like this one, it can change it, you know, it can help you read out and make it into a karyogram. So it's a baby step artificial intelligence is taking in our field, and we're very excited about what's to come. All right, so with that, I just wanna thank uh, the wonderful Clinical Cancer Genomics Lab at Fred Hutch. Everybody worked hard on to, to take care of patients every day, and I want to also thank uh, our collaborators at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. So, thank you. We spend a lot of time working on something like OGM when the other thing that's just around the corner is long-range sequencing. It probably doesn't even require super duper harm like the way DNA. Do, 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 what, do you, what do you see as the role of the long range sequencing um, going forward? Yeah, the long range sequencing, I don't know how close they are to clinical applications though. Are you talking about things like Pacific bi uh, Pac Bio, yeah. right? Yeah, it, it, I think between an assay versus an assay that can use clinically, the, the drive of the of the company is, is very critical. Uh, I'm not clear how, how much like Backpack Bio want to just keep their, their assay in the research realm or that they would like to bring it in, in clinical uh, assay. But I think I, I can hear you. It's, it's long read, but it's not as long as OGM. So maybe it, the sample handling is not as challenging. Yeah. That was fantastic. Thank you. Um, can you just you know, I think it's a really interesting question as well about the long read sequencing, but it, um, and I appreciate that with OGM, the software, um, like, you know, like some of the companies that we've been using for years, we the Array software and now with the OGM software, do you feel like, I guess, like how are you thinking about moving forward with OGM? Do you think it is ready to be put into clinical practice because of the strong software that has been developed to assist in the interpretation of that, like we have with arrays, or how, what do you, how do you how do you see that fitting into your clinical workout in the future? Great question, Kate. Um, I think the question, do I need to repeat the question? The question is where, where what's my thought on the really incorpor incorporation of OGM in clinical assay. So I know that there are maybe a few labs, one or two, three, maybe nationwide or North America at least, they are using it clinically. So there are people who are doing that. And the software, I've tried it. Uh, I can handle it. <laughs> I mean, it can, it, it, and I feel the company is very active. They, they want to optimize it, optimize, make it usable for clinical labs. And it's something that we can have our hands on and practice with. So I do have a lot of um, hope and confidence in this assay. Um, yeah. Follow up on that sure. one real quick. Just, I, I like the point you were making with the IKZF1 deletions and how you could kind of, you know, tell the difference between different classes of IKZF1 deletions by array, even if you don't have quite like, that same exome level resolution. Right. Um, and certainly with OGM, I think it's not sequencing. Um, the coverage, you know, they, there are claims that you can see down to 500 base pair deletions, but it's really dependent on where those labels are. Have you done any comparison studies between your array data and OGM to see that's a good point. Yeah, it's it's not a sequencing assay. The the resolution is not 
is not exact, right? It really depends on how many probe, how many markers you have in that location. So we have not done the comparison for ICROS-1, but it is pretty clear that it can call out MLL, PTD, which is even smaller than ICROS-1 with like pretty correctly. Um, so, yeah. So um, we have over uh, 60 online attendees, uh, just to let you know. And we have um, an online question. What are the potential drawbacks associated with the use of AI in clinical diagnostics? Kind of broadly. Yeah. Remember that photo where I showed the comparison where there are people and people and people and then in NGS there's almost no people until the last step. So with AI, I mean, I think we, we face the same problem. Uh, well, I guess it's a more philosophical question for AI, right? It, I, th as clinical laboratorians, we're the one who's the custodian. We, 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 not custodian. We're the one who ultimately responsible for the quality of the result. So no matter how complicated this word algorithm makes us feel like, when we validate an assay, we have to take real patient samples, we have to take a high number of them, and then to really test it out. So I, I think that discipline applies AI or not AI. So in the, in the OGM, you only have one color and one six mer so the OGM assay, uh, it's, it's been out there for a long time. Uh, there are different, different enzymes and different colors that can be used to labeling, but currently commercially available, there is this one option. It's green and it just labels that particular it deal. increase the resolution if you had more places to label and even different color labels. Really. That makes sense, yeah. But right now they're not available commercially. There are research labs that does that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.